it's such a privilege to have you all here, and it's really um, my pleasure and privilege to um, introduce our next speaker, Bob Trask, and his wife, Mary. So it's wonderful having you here. Bob Trask is an international speaker. We're really lucky to have him here. He's an international motivational speaker and inspirational speaker. So let's put our hands together for Mr. Bob Trask. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me here, and thanks for coming out and being here on this Sunday. Um, there's a camera shooting over here, so I just wanted to let you people know on this side that these folks over here are in the Witness Protection Program. <laughs> so you don't know them. You have never seen them. Today we're going to do some interesting things. We're going to talk about meditation. And my hopes are that when you go home today, you will have some meditative techniques that you can use. I know most of you probably already meditate. How many people here have taken meditation classes? Almost everyone. How many of you meditate regularly? OK. So when I say, how many people take meditation classes, I get this. When I say, how many people meditate regularly, I get this. <laughs> So I know, I know what that means, because I also am a meditator, and I've been meditating for many, many, many years. I, I first started meditating when I was a free diver, and I was free diving every day, and my intention was to get down deeper and stay longer. And when I got down to 60 feet um, in fairly cold water, which you can stay down, get down farther, in warm water and stay down longer. But I was diving in about 60 feet of water and 60 feet to the bottom of, the, of where I was diving, so that's why I went to 60 feet. But it, at a minute and a half, I was done. I mean, I had to be back on the surface in a minute and a half or I was toast. So I thought, gosh, I've got to be able to stay down longer than that. I just can't stay down longer than that. I don't know what to do. Plus, when I would come up to fish, they would go and shoot away from me. And I wanted to get closer to the fish. So a guy came aboard. I was a sea captain. I was running some kind of dive trips. And we had some National Geographic photographers that went out with us. And we did some really interesting underwater stuff. But a, a young kid came on just for a summer job. And he knew how to meditate. He'd taken transcendental meditation. So he taught me how to meditate. They, you know, you're not supposed to teach. If you're a transcendental meditator, you're not supposed to teach somebody. You're supposed to have them go take the class, and get their own mantra. But you know, he, he, you know, he had something I wanted, and I, so I had something he wanted. So, <laughs> so he taught me how to meditate, and it was kind of a clumsy little session. But I practiced it, and as I practiced it, I noticed that some things started changing in my life. I noticed that people who, when there are some people that I would approach some people on my crew, and there was like this vibration between us, and it was like static electricity. As the closer they got, and I'd say, "Hi, John, how's it going?" You know, it's just this. And I noticed that that went away. I noticed that I began, you know, when when I'd get close to John, I'd make, I'd started seeing, hey, this is kind of an interesting guy, and I started hearing what he was really saying. So that was really interesting for me. What I didn't feel that was going to happen, which really happened, is that I, when I dove, I started staying down longer. And when I came back up to the surface, you come back up to the surface and soak out. I mean, you dive down, you stay as long as you can. Come back up to the surface and you lay on the surface. Because if you're a free diver, the top of the water is like a mattress. You just lay there, and breathe through your snorkel, and get your oxygen back, and blow off the excess CO2, and get ready to go back down again. I noticed that I had, didn't have to stay up nearly as long. I could come up and just go back down again. It was, the whole experience was so different. What else was really exciting was that fish stopped running from me. I didn't, I didn't understand that. I would see a great big sea bass, and I would start swimming toward it, and it would just turn and start swimming toward me. I had no idea what that was about, and of course I did. You know, is that I was no longer fighting everything, and I no longer had this big bristly aura of, I don't want to, I was just, just sort of being with the water. 
And when I would dive, incidentally, when I would dive, and I think most divers would tell you this, when I dive, especially if it was in deep water, when I bent over to go down, there was always a little fear. And as I went down, the deeper I got, the more I felt the pressure of the water, the darker it got as I went down, the more that fear would increase. Now, it wasn't a terror, it was just fear. But after I was free diving for a while, I felt like I belonged in the ocean. I felt like I was at home in the ocean. Then I started diving in Hawaii in warm water. Then I could stay down over two minutes. Then after a while, I could stay down over three minutes. Then I saw I was out swimming one day off of uh, um, the city of refuge, and I saw a group of spinner dolphins coming through. There was a, a group that just live in that area, spinner dolphins. And I swam out, and they just came over to me, and they swam all around me, and I was swimming right along with them. And it was a marvelous experience. After that, several times, I was able to swim in the Hawaii area with whales. One day, uh, swimming off of Kailua Kona, I went down, and a mother was on the bottom at about 40 feet, and her calf was laying right next to her. And I was able to go down and just swim up and swim around them and be close to them. And I mean, it's just marvelous experiences. So if meditation worked that well for this hard-knuckled, hard-headed sea captain, imagine what it would do for you in your life with the relationships, with your health, with the energy that flows in and around you if you were to live in a meditative state. And what I mean by living in a meditative state isn't that you always go around with this, oh, I just think that you, your, whole, your whole aura, your whole ambience slows down and you begin to flow with the river of life. <clears throat> in one of my earlier seminars and in my first book, I talk about um, that there is, that life is like a river. And, 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 I, and I give this example, which was so perfect for me, because I was doing a lot of river rafting at that time, and it made so much sense that if there's a dock out into the river, and there's an old frayed rope hanging off the end of the dock that somebody's forgotten, and you walk out, this is birth, you walk out and you say, I'm going to jump in the river, and you jump in the river, and then you say, oh my God, it's wild and moving, and I don't understand, and as you go by the rope, you grab onto it. Now I'm safe. So you're hanging on this rope, and you're water, water in your face, and you're hanging on, and your arms are tired, and your hands are And a lot of people live like, like, life like that, just hanging onto the rope. <laughs> but if you let go of the rope, and let the river just take you, then you go by farms and villages and wonderful, beautiful things. And you still have control. You can swim over here. You can swim back there. You can even swim up the river a little ways before you get tired. But mostly, great spirit knows what it's doing, knows where it's flowing, knows where it's going and knows why, understands perfectly who you are. You are the only one that has ever, ever, ever been incarnated. You're the only one. Out of the trillions and trillions of people who will come into or have come into this planet, into this family of humans, you are the only one. No other one has ever had or will ever have your thumbprint, your voice print, your iris print, the neuronal pattern of your brain, your voice, no other one. You're the only one because your soul, that's who I'm talking to incidentally is soul. I mean, I'm not talking to ears and bodies. I'm talking to souls. I'm talking to who you really are, the eternal being. You as a soul are the perfect incarnation of great spirit, but you're the only one. You're the only incarnation that is like you. You're the only one. You're the only one that can, there's a whole lot of you listening to my voice here. There's a lot of you listening to my voice now on tape, but no one else is hearing what you're hearing. No one else is hearing the voice or the tone that you're hearing. No one else is getting the message that you're getting or not getting. No one else. You're the only one. The only one. And when you're in that river, when you let go of the rope and get into that river and live and flow with, the, with grace, with the harmony of the universe, with the soul of great spirit, with the breath of God, 
When you live in that way every day, you then, as Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And believe me, when you live like that, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Now today we're going to talk a little bit about meditation, but we're also going to talk about Afghanistan and the wars that are going on there and the people that are dying there, the people that are dying in Iraq. What about those poor people who are being just slaughtered throughout very par various parts of Africa? What can we do about that? We're, we're Americans. We live in this utopian society. Even the poorest of us are richer than most of the people in the world. What can we do? If a tree becomes injured by lightning or an accident or by an infestation of, of um, vermin of some kind or a disease. Here's this little limb clear out over here on the edge. And off of this limb is this little tendril. And off of this tendril are two or three leaves. And those leaves are saying, I'm way over here and I'm just this little leaf. What can I do? What can I do? There's, I mean, I know that this big tree that I'm a part of has got some problems, but what can I do? And the answer is you can be all that you can be. Because if you be all that you can be, then the energy and the sustenance that you send back into the mother tree may be enough to heal the other part. So we have an obligation and an opportunity today and every day, to help heal the human race in this galaxy by being the most powerful leaves on the tree that we can be. And we don't need to go to Haiti or to Africa, but we need to let our individual lights shine so brightly that the lights around us are turned on and in turn turn the lights on in other hearts and lives and souls so that we enrich, empower, and bring health to the whole human family in only the way that we can because we're the only one. If you think your contribution doesn't amount to much, let me remind you that you're the only one. I mean, maybe you take a variety of, of uh, vitamins every day. You take C and D and E and, you know. But, well, you're the C. You're the only C there is. If you, don't, if you don't put yours out there, there's an incomplete package. If we have a jigsaw puzzle here that we lay out of the entire world and the human race and all of nature, and there's six billion parts in that puzzle... And we all get together and put that puzzle together. And when we're finished, there's a piece missing. What's the most obvious part of the puzzle? Don't be the missing piece. Just don't be the missing piece. We have the period from when we're born to when we die. We have that period of time. Pretty brief period of time. But we can't waste any of it. We can't afford to waste one minute of it. 